Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, I'm honored and delighted always to have uh, Brian McVeigh back. And we are doing this entire series on Julian Jaynes. So what are we talking about today, Brian? Um, well, first, let me say uh, thank you for having me again. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending um, today's uh, discussion. So today, I'm going to continue last week's talk about hallucinations. And uh, I'm sure some of you uh, attended that. Um, if, you, if you did not attend it, um, as I said, this is a continuation. Hopefully, you'll be able to fill in some of the uh, gaps if it's not clear to you. And of course, um, if something is not clear, we, we can talk about that during the discussion uh, period. So to get started, what I'll do is I'm going to put up a um, uh, PowerPoint. And uh, so is that up all right? Yeah, it's good. Okay, you're, you're so actually, right let me, um, uh, okay, can uh, everyone hear me okay? Yes, the sound is good. All right, so uh, I'm not going to go through all the slides last week. I'm going to sort of start in the middle of um, this slide presentation. But in any case, just to show you the uh, the title of uh, what we're going to be talking about, hallucinations as adaptive behavior. So as I said last week, we usually don't put hallucinations in the same word with adaptation because adaptation has a positive sense to it. Hallucinations, of course, has a negative sense to it. Something's going wrong. Why are people seeing things that don't exist? But if you're familiar with Julian Jaynes, of course, you'll know that that was one of the main points he tried to make in his work is that actually at one time in human history, hallucinations were adaptive. If that's the case, there should be vestiges of uh, this sort of psychological of phenomena. And that's basically what we're gonna be talking about today. So to sort of just skip ahead over what we talked about last week, I can always go back to this if someone does want to look at it for, for, for some reason, but for the sake of time, um, I'll just skip ahead to uh, today's uh, talk. So let's start here. So again, we're talking about vestigial bicameriality and examples of that could include spirit possession, hypnosis, uh, channeling, glossolalia, uh, audiovisual hallucinations experienced not just by schizophrenics, in other words, people suffering from some sort of pathopsychological condition, but also from uh, people who have not been diagnosed with uh, hallucination, uh, with uh, some sort of mental disorder, also experience hallucinations. Uh, they're more common than uh, many of us uh, think. And so this focus today on the, the vestigial bicameriality, uh, I think the way we, we have to look at it as this is just one piece of what we might call the Jamesian puzzle. And to me, as a researcher, Jaynes makes sense because he attempted to take all these different pieces of a puzzle and put them together. And these pieces, of course, include hallucinations, hypnosis, uh, ph phenomena from the ancient um, world, um, certain things uh, in the traditional religion that have not been adequately explained from a psychological scientific perspective. So I, I'm just mentioning that to sort of give you a, a general idea of why this is attractive to me and what I'm trying to do with all these different things and fit them together, all these different pieces and fit them together into a coherent um, puzzle. So today I'm gonna to look at a, a specific type of vestige of the bicameral mind, uh, which are called otoscopic phenomena or sometimes people call, call them uh, mirror hallucinations. And what happens is that an individual sees 
what is called in the literature their second body, or sometimes uh, they'll they'll say that they see a double or a parasoma. Um, so uh, there are many examples of this, and I think probably the most common word from folklore that relates to this phenomena of seeing yourself is doppelganger, which is a German word that means double walker. And uh, if you look in folklore or literature, as I said, you can find many examples. So for example, the philosopher and writer, uh, Goethe uh, claimed that um, one night he was, he was on his horse and he saw his double coming toward him on a horse. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I on her deathbed supposedly claimed that she could see herself uh, right before she died. Um, Catherine the Great of Russia claimed that one night she was being chased down the halls of her palace by her double and she ordered her guards to shoot at her double. Oftentimes doppelgangers or, or, or doubles uh, appear when someone is under some sort of stress um, in mythology the idea is when you die you will see your your double um so in any case just can kind, of, kind of give everybody uh, an idea here that um th th this has been recorded throughout history th th there's nothing in a sense th 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 this is a worldwide uh, phenomenon in a sense there's nothing terribly um uh, i suppose strange about it you might say but in any case, um, to get started, let's look at the what we can call three types of autoscopic phenomena. So this one here, out-of-body experience, this is probably the most commonly reported. You hear a lot of people uh, talk about how they were in the hospital, perhaps they were very ill, and uh, during a surgery or some sort of medical procedure, they floated out of their body and they looked down and they, they could see their body. Um, this one, autoscopic hallucination, again, that's commonly described as a doppelganger experience where you see your double or parasoma. The parasoma is often um, transparent. The, your, the double or the parasoma will sometimes mimic your behavior or maybe even talk back to you, or follow you around like a shadow. Um, and then cutoscopy. Now, this is very unusual. Uh, well, it's very hard to explain, I should say, uh, because if you look, if you look at the arrow, it's going both ways. And the reason why is because people who experience Hugh, Hugh autoscopy will claim that they're not sure which was the real them. Okay, they can't really place their sense of being in uh, in uh, the parasoma or themselves. So it, it's it's a very, like I said, it's, it's a bit difficult to explain, but let me, um, I just want to very quickly uh, read you a, a quote to sort of illustrate uh, what we're talking about. And by the way, in the literature, the, it, the, the terminology is not really settled on how to describe these uh, phenomena. It, it, different researchers will use different terms. So it gets a little bit confusing. But in any case, in, in one, one word that I prefer to use sometimes is rather than autoscopic is autovision, to have a vision of yourself. So autovision involves complex psychological manifestations, such as the sharing of thoughts, words, emotions, or actions with the parasoma. So Again, the idea is you're not clear what is real. Am I real or is the double real? And that is called feelings of bilocation, feelings of bilocation being located in two places at once. In other words, it is important to stress that these experiences not just perceived physical reduplication. It's not just an illusion, but a strong psychological sense of selfness and identification with the parasoma. Parasomas then are more than just mere sensory perception of an altered body. 
since they are strongly felt to be part or to share something with oneself. Some people have reported observing one's double committing suicide or witnessing the double taking on a more autonomous existence and exhibiting aggression toward the person who is having this experience. Some people, for example, Catherine the Great, have attempted to kill their double. So it's not clear how many people in a given population have these types of experiences. Some researchers have claimed maybe it, it may be as high as 10% of any given population. Um, but in any case, as I said, these experiences have played a prominent role in religious accounts, folklore, literature, and art. In order to understand otoscopy or autovisions, neuroanatomical and functional approaches have been employed. In other words, some people have taken a, have taken a medical approach, assuming that there's some sort of pathology that's causing these these experiences. Um, but as I said before, for me, autoscopy is a vestige of an earlier mentality uh, that was um, that it, it was rooted in a time when hallucinations had an, ad, uh, an adaptive value. So to continue, how do we account for autoscopic hallucinations? And as I just said, I think it has to do with vestigial neurostructures. Um, to, to give you another example, a very famous example from the ancient religious, uh, from ancient religion, uh, for those of you who are familiar with um, Egypt, you'll know that in ancient Egypt, they used to talk a lot about uh, ka, that's K-A, ka. There's no good translation in English for what ka meant. Uh, sometimes people will translate it as spirit or soul or double. Personally, I think double is, is the best translation. And the idea in ancient Egypt, it was believed that when you're born, your ka is born with you. And the ka is something like a shadow. It follows you around through life. It can influence the way you think. And then when you die, the ka becomes associated with your grave or, or your tomb. And in ancient Egypt, they had an expression when a person died that he or she was going back to their ka. And a ka was something that would have to be tended to when a person died. So your, aunt, so your relatives, your family, would feed the ka. And often there was some sort of representation in the tomb, perhaps a statue of the ka. And the idea is that the ka could communicate with the relatives left behind. And so what's important about this idea of the ka is that this was an idea that animated Egyptian religiosity for two, 3,000 years. So something must have been going on. I don't think it's enough to say this was just some belief, some superstition that they had. I think that uh, bicameral uh, Egyptians were actually having hallucinations of um, what they called the Ka. So in any case, that's just one example to, to fit into this discussion. So these are just some other uh, graphics that people have come up with to illustrate uh, doubles and out of out of body experiences. Uh, just some more illustrations. And actually, let me go back and um, I forgot to mention something here. So typically, when people talk about autoscopic phenomena or autovisions, they list three types: out of body experience. Huatoscopy and autoscopic hallucinations. But there's a fourth type of experience that may may not fit into autoscopic phenomena, um, feeling of a presence. And uh, some people report feeling the presence of someone who recently died, you know, a, a close relative or family member. Um, some people just report that they feel they can sense that there is someone, some entity 
in the room with them and they turn around and no one's there, but they know they're, they're convinced that something or someone is following them around. Um, and uh, it's a very a strong experience. Uh, and, and, and I say that because I don't think it's enough to say, oh, it's just their imagination. I think feeling of a presence is a singular psychological experience that is somehow related to autoscopic phenomena. So, so in the medical literature, uh, there are a number of explanations uh, to try and explain autoscopic phenomena. Um, agnosia is one of them. Um, Somatognosia is another. Uh, the, the, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it gets a little bit uh, technical, but um, there's this idea that it has something to do with loss of awareness of one's own body, uh, failure to integrate proprioceptive, tactile, and visual information with respect to one's own body sch uh, schemata. So, so there, as I said, there, there, there are explanations, but my problem with these explanations is that these are more descriptions. They're not explaining why the human neurological apparatus is designed in the first place to have such uh, experiences. So that's a very important point to keep in mind. So in other words, there's a difference between an, some sort of phenomena or phenomenon uh, being associated with versus caused by. So describing the neurology or etiology is not the same as explaining why hallucinatory autoscopic experiences take the particular shape that they do, which is um, the form of another, well, in this case, uh, the, uh, it, it takes the form of the presence of ourselves. Somehow we are projecting ourselves outside of our body which is, you know, sort of a, yeah, an, an odd experience. So we have to ask um, what, what's going on there. So if otoscopic phenomena are remnants of an adaptive hallucinatory neuropsychology, then perhaps seeing with the mind's eye, in other words, just closing our eyes and picturing what I did yesterday or what I was doing on the vacation I took last year or where I want to be next year, in other words, seeing with the mind's eye, that, that those experiences are in fact an updated uh, or updated hallucinatory, hallucinatory experiences that are more adapted to the modern world. So if you remember from last year's talk, or not last year's, rather um, last week's talk, what I'm trying to do is tie everything together and make the claim that what we see with our mind's eye, what we visualize is in fact a neurological descendant of hallucinatory experiences. So mental image, so mental imagery is, uh, it's an adaptation, I believe. But what's important is it's something we have to learn. We have to learn how to have mental images and that's based on metaphoric language. And we've I've talked about that before in other podcasts, of course. But so what's important and what's the, important here is that mental images are not something we're born with. They're not biological, we, they're cultural. We have to learn how to have mental images. So that word, introception, if you, if you notice, uh, what does introception mean? It, it, well, um, introception, it means something like introspection, but it's a little bit different. Introception is the counterpart to what most people call perception. So perception is something that comes through our senses. It's sensate. Whereas introception is something that we conjure up using our mind's eye, something that we uh, experience, to use a metaphor, in our head. Another word for introception might be quasi-perceptions. So the idea here is why are mental images adaptive? Um, 
in the form of introception. Well, introception is employed in the selection, rehearsal, planning, and perfecting of adaptive activities. In other words, the ability to have mental images provides us with a very powerful psychological tool to plan for the future, to think about mistakes that I made in the past, how to do things differently, to rehearse. So in other words, the way to phrase this, a means to guide experimentally and transform experience by running off activity cycles as mental simulations of the real thing. So before I engage in a very risky behavior, mental imagery allows me to experience it virtually in my head or to run a simulation in my head. Um, so that's why mental uh, images or introception are uh, adaptive. But when you stop and think about it, I've mentioned this before, what's interesting about mental images, there's something very mysterious about them. Uh, there, there's no way to see the mental image of another person while they're experiencing it. So what's going on there? It's almost as if mental images exist in their own ontological reality in, in another plane of existence. Um, and I, I don't, I hesitate uh, uh, from talking that way because it sounds a bit mystical, but the point is we still don't understand where or what mental images are. We know a lot about perception. Neuroscience, neuroscientists have done a lot of research on perception, but when it comes to introception, there's still a lot we simply don't understand. So the primary function of consciousness is, well, it's a type of adaptation. And when I say consciousness here, um, of course, I'm talking about Jamesian consciousness. And so if you're not familiar with the, the Jane, what James meant by consciousness, some of this may not make much sense. But in any case, sometimes I use the word conscious interiority. So the idea here is uh, conscious interior, interiority. It's the mental rehearsal of adaptive goal-directed action through the experimental ma manipulation of perceptual motor imagery. So in other words, you're not using real perceptions, you're using images of perceptions in your head in order to adapt to your environment. So introception conjures up what is viewable in your mind, in your head, a cognitive map of the world infused with a menu of maybes, perhaps, and possibilities. And the idea, of course, according to Jaynes, is that 3,000 years ago, people were not able to introceive. They were not able to function using consciousness. Um, and they would have to rely on the commands and voices of the gods and ancestors in order to um, come up with um, plans. Um, in, in any case, uh, if, if that's not clear, we, uh, we can talk about that later, because I know that for some people that sounds like uh, quite, quite a claim, especially if you're not familiar with what James had to say. So I'm going to uh, talk uh, about, um, or I'm, well, I should say, I'm going to introduce some terminology here in the conclusion to try and make things more clear, because that's the problem with a lot of psychological research. We're using words and they're all over the place, they're all over the map, and people really don't know uh, what other researchers are talking about and they, they, they end up talking past each other. So if perception is a sensory reflection of the physical word, world, rather, a hallucination superimposes experiences over perception. Okay. okay, so I'm trying to get at exactly what a hallucination is. To avoid negative associations of the word hallucination, I use superception, which is a cognitive technique of going beyond what the immediate environment offers to the individual. So superception just means going beyond sensory perception. All right. Um, basically, well, let me just uh, uh, explain. So there are four types of superceptions. All right. 
extraception, which are audiovisual hallucinations of gods and ancestors, which James spent a lot of time writing about uh, in his book. And then there are vestigial extraceptions, anomalous behavior, for example, what we've just been talking about, autoscopic phenomena, perhaps hallucinations experienced by schizophrenic, um, other types of uh, strange psychological behavior that we don't really have uh, good explanations for. And then of course, introception, this is something I've already talked about. A quick and easy definition might be interiorized model of reality in your head, something that you experience in a quasi perceptual way. And then finally, uh, paraceptions. So paraceptions, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this. There's actually a list of paraceptions, but um, paraceptions share attributes of both perceptions and superceptions. It's sort of a leftover category that includes things like pseudo hallucination. So in other words, a pseudo hallucination is when someone has a hallucination, but they have insight into the fact that what they're seeing is not real. Right. So many times, most of the time, when you have a hallucination, you think it's real. All right. So pseudo hallucination is a little bit different. It's an example of what I call paraceptions. So usually when we interiorize cognition, in other words, when we are conscious, we experience what I call coception. And that is an alignment of perception with introception. And so th this is a little bit tricky. But um, uh, this is why people get confused, I think. So th this is why even research psychologists and neuroscientists, a lot of the research, I think, is missing the point because they think that introception is the same thing as perception. And I think part of the reason why many of us assume that is because what I see in front of me often is what my mind's eye is also experiencing at the same time. I can change that. I can close my eyes and demand my mind's eye to conjure up a completely different scene from what is in front of me, of course. But often going through daily life, perception is aligned with introception. So there are good adaptive reasons why perception and introception often overlap. Um, and by the way, uh, introceptions are generated, but they are not determined by um, perception. Uh, so for example, I can sit down, close my eyes, and I can imagine pink unicorns flying around my house, but that has nothing to do with perception of what I, what I would actually see if I opened my eyes. Um, but so the point is, is that perception and introceptions do not necessarily uh, line up with each other. So last week I talked about this, I made this point, um, but I'm just going to reiterate this point because I think it's very important. So this is all very interesting, you know, but how strong is the evidence of some of the claims uh, that I've been making uh, today and last week? Um, and uh, some of you uh, know, I, I, I've published on this and uh, th there is evidence that th there are scientific attempts uh, that have been made in order to um, bolster the claims made by Jane's about hallucinations and about how do hallucinations relate to mental imagery. So, so there, 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 there is evidence out there, but we have to be open-minded. And one thing we have to do, a very important thing we have to do that I think research psychologists do not do is pay attention to the ancient world and pay attention to how human mentality has changed, uh, the, the, uh, did radically change about 3,000 years ago, of course. The, the, I'm talking about the transition from the bicameral mind to uh, conscious interiority. Um, and in order to do that, we have to break the argument down into different hypotheses, into different propositions. And that's what I tried to do in a lot of my uh, writing and um, in research. And I think if you look at a collection of hypotheses that are trying to support a larger, more general theory, things become more persuasive, things become more uh, convincing. Um, and I talked about this last week also, degrees of probability. So 
you know, even in the physical sciences, it's not about proving something. It's about coming up with a lot of evidence to the point where the evidence seems to overwhelm any doubt. And, and um, the way I do things, if and I do apply statistics, um, I do use stats in some of my research. And basically, if I come up with 75% um, degree of probability, I'm satisfied. I think that's the best we can probably do when we're talking about history of psychology. In fact, I think in many of the social sciences, uh, if we can come up with uh, evidence that seems to fall within the range of uh, um, certainly above possible, but more around likely, that, that, would be, that would be the target range. I think we're doing a pretty good job, all right? And I say that because especially to argue Jane's points, we have to look at ancient history and things can become a bit complex because the record is not complete. Of course, we have no complete archeological record or textual record of any society, uh, especially the further we go back. But I do think we have enough evidence to come up with some hypotheses, some statistical propositions that we can make and, um, and just uh, see where the chips fall. And so in any case, I'm just mentioning that there because I think sometimes in the past when I've talked about Jane's uh, or written about Jane's, you know, people will say, well, it, it, this all sounds very interesting. It, it's sort of a uh, intriguing uh, theory, but um, there's really no evidence for it. And that, that simply is not the case. Uh, we just have to, uh, as I said, um, put our research hats on and have an open mind and look at what evidence is actually out there. And so case in point, uh, you know, th th these are so some of the books, uh, th these books were put together by uh, my colleague, uh, Marcel Kaustin. Um, and, uh, and then of course, a few of my own books and as, and as I said, in these books, I try to be as objective and I don't like to use the word science, scientific because actually I was not trained in the natural sciences. I was trained in, trained in the social scientists, but, but I, I still think there's a place for science in the humanities, in history, in the social sciences. And uh, the, 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 the point I'm making is that um, it's not about whether something sounds like it makes sense, right? Many things in the scientific world sound bizarre and odd, right? The findings of astrophysicists, um, quantum mechanics, evolution, Darwinian evolution itself. A lot of people today still have a problem accepting it. These things, uh, the, the, these ideas, these th revolutionary theories um, at first glance sound bizarre, but from a scientific point of view, they add up. And I think we have to have the same attitude when we look at um, uh, an author such as uh, James. So in any case, I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Uh, folks, so now is the time for questions. You can ask any question on this particular topic or any aspect of Julian Jane's uh, approach to consciousness and this subject in general. So go ahead. We got four rules as usual. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask questions. Number two, uh, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, speak your mind. Feel free to disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. So you can go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would if you have a question. All right, I'm going to give a few seconds and then I'm going to ask questions. I always have many many questions. All right. Okay. Um so I mean, one of the things, you know, when I discovered Julian Jaynes for the first time, 
one of the things that I really got from it is the value of looking at the past and how people processed information at that time, not just for historical reasons, but because it explains what we are doing now. So can you speak a little bit about that, the value of looking at previous mentalities and what can it give us about our current mentalities? Well, that's, um, that's sort of a, a big question. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where to uh, begin, but um, certainly it's easy to relate uh, any type of answer to uh, the difference between oral and uh, literate cultures. And so there, there's, I think some people might have the idea that actually literacy, which if we know anything about, for example, the arguments of Walter Ong and McLuhan, the idea is that literacy uh, changed civilization, it changed how people processed information, how they stored information, and that this was something that happened maybe several thousand years ago. But the reality is, it's much more complicated, much more subtle than that, because it may be hard to believe many people were not really literate around the world until maybe 100, 200 years ago. Um, and and that, that, that's one point I should make. And then related to that is, what does it mean actually to be literate? Uh, so when you go to a typical school, you'll see students same age, same grade, and some are more literate than others in a sense that they can, they, they process, they can read quicker, they can um, perhaps they have a uh, better uh, ability to remember things, they can write faster, they're more articulate in how they express themselves. So these words, orality and literacy, I actually think there's a lot more uh, explore, exploration that needs to be done in terms of what these terms mean. And then also, we were, you were talking earlier uh, today about, um, with me, about um, secondary orality um, and other forms of literacy and how does technology all play into this. And I think that uh, James did not explicitly talk about technology as a driver of human history, as a sort of driver of, of changes in uh, human psyche. But I really think that that's something that needs to be addressed. You can certainly make that argument uh, because basically that's what literacy is. Literacy is a type of technology and literacy has become more and more embedded or more and more a part of technology. And of course, I'm thinking about the digital revolution. Um, I mean, not just Gutenberg going back um, six, 700 years, but also with uh, what's happened uh, more recently where we have new types of literacy and how orality and literacy sort of get intertwined with each other. And the, the thing about liter about orality, of course, is it's not going to go away, right? We're still oral creatures. It's not as if when we became literate being somehow we stop being oral beings. So you have these multiple layers of orality and literacy, and then you throw in technology and they, it all gets sort of tangled up in a very complex way. And so this is where very fine grained type of research is necessary. Uh, and an example is when you look at the way, how language has changed because of the way people use their cell phones. Um, there are many other examples, you know, I, I, of course we could give, but, um, and how, when you look at how people write using a cell phone, it's a strange combination of or, or habits from morality and also a more up-to-date digital habits, if you will. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, we'll, we'll continue on. This is a fascinating topic. Um, we're going to have uh, Sarah. I forget her last name right now, but uh, she has edited a book uh, and prepared the book of the last book that Walter Ong prepared. Um, and she published it along with her co-author posthumously, uh, which is about language as hermeneutics. And that's where she, you know, Walter Ong talks at length about how language itself changes across these technologies and how the change is actually very complex. 
Yes. Every new technology really changes the way in which you old, which you use old technology. Like for example, we continue to talk. I'm still talking. I'm still talking, but the way I'm talking is different because of the fact of writing, because of literacy. It is different because of the fact of printing. All those books are there in my head. Some of the books are there in my head. And that is changing the way in which, which is different than if I could just write as a scribe, few things. Then it, the way I'm talking is different because I have access to the internet and I'm using all that digital. The way I'm talking is different because we are doing this over Zoom. The amount of interactivity that is possible with the sheer number of people is different. So all that shapes the way in which language works. And all those, as Brian was pointing out, all these relationships are, are very complex and very, very subtle and very interesting. And that's what uh, you know, we'll be talking about. Uh, so next it's going to be, and your questions take priority. I always have questions for Brian, but your questions take priority. So it's going to be Mary, Dominique and George. Mary. Hi, um, I believe you mentioned Brian that it was a, neuro, a, a neurological development to move from hallucinations to seeing yourself in your mind's eye in this abstract sense. If, 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 I, if I understood that correctly. And when I think about seeing myself or in my mind's eye, like I'm going to jewel, it has a purpose um, in the sense that I can move across time and I can move across place by imagining myself at jewel tonight, picking up groceries. It, it allows me to function better, analyze situations. Maybe it's pleasurable. Do you think that in, do you think that the, uh, there is a purpose behind having hallucination, seeing like a doppelganger originally, or did the purpose evolve as well? Yes, I think the purpose did evolve. Uh, it did change why we have hallucinations. Um, I, I mean, when we have hallucinations in modern times, either it's maladaptive or there's no real clear cut reason why we're having a hallucination. Though, of course, some people who have hallucinations do get meaning from the voices that they hear. So I don't want to say that they're completely maladaptive. But um, to get back to what you said about being a neurological development. So I, in my, what I was, in, in the talk today, I, I use that word a lot, neurological. But I want to be very clear. I am not saying that there was a neurological change or that uh, the transition from hearing bicameral voices to engaging in mental images was a neurological development. Of course, you need neurology to do those things. The real change from bicameral hallucinations to introception or mental images was cultural. And that's really the key point of Jane's book. And that's, of course, how I would how I look at things. And that's the argument I would make. We're not talking about a neurological change or neuro, certainly not a neuroanatomical change. We're talking about a change in culture. And when I say culture, to be more specific, I'm talking about language. The language changed. And that's clear in the historical record. There was no psychological terminology before about a before maybe 3000 BCE, at least not a, not a robust terminology to describe psychological events. Something happened, something changed. People started to use metaphors to describe their experiences and those metaphors led to a psychological lexicon. And that change in culture and language led to the transition from the bicameral mind to uh, uh, conscious interiority. So that's, that's a very in, important point. And I think the problem with a lot of uh, research, especially in the neuroscientific world, is that they're, they ignore culture. They, they, they ignore 
what people learn from their environment. They ignore the, the actual language we use and how that language can change our psychological experiences. Uh, and that's really what I'm, that, that, that's the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, culture and language themselves are psychological. And I think there's a sort of mistaken view that their neurological level or the brain is a more real reality and that all we have to do is understand how the brain works. Of course, we do have to figure that out, but that will not give us all the answers to what it means to be a, psych a psychological being. That will not explain uh, consciousness. That will not explain why our psychological experiences have changed over the centuries and why they still are changing. So um, I, I hope that uh, clarifies uh, the points for you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Brian. I just wanted to stress the, uh, the, you know, uh, the point that you're making that language changes over time. Uh, and that's a huge deal. I mean, for example, Julian Jaynes talked about the fact that you know, we are actually developing our consciousness as we speak. And most people regard language as static. So I wanna give you just one example of how language changes. Now, this is not a change of technology. This is one person just engaging with language and the impact it has on language. So this is a quote, okay? If you cannot understand my argument and declare it's all Greek to me, you're quoting Shakespeare. If your lost property has vanished into thin air, you're quoting Shakespeare. If you have ever refused to budge an inch or if you have played fast and loose, if you have been tongue tied, a tower of strength hoodwinked or in a pickle, if you have knitted your brows, made a virtue of necessity, insisted on fair play, slept not one wink, stood on ceremony, laughed yourself into stitches, had short shrift or too much of a good thing. If you've seen better days or lived in fool's paradise, it is a foregone conclusion that you are as good luck would have it, quoting Shakespeare. If you clear out bag and baggage, if you think it's high time and that that is the long and short of it, if you believe that the game is up and the truth will out, even if it involves your own flesh and blood, if you lie low because you suspect foul play, if you have your teeth set on edge in, at one fell swoop without rhyme or reason, then to give the devil his due, if the truth were known, you are quoting Shakespeare. Even if you bid me good riddance and send me packing, if you wish I was dead as a door now, if you think that I'm an eyesore, a laughing stock, the devil incarnate, a stony hearted villain, bloody minded, blinking idiot, and then by Jove, O oh Lord, for goodness sake, what the dickens, it is all one to me for your quoting Shakespeare. So this is all Shakespeare. Now, uh, you know, taking language, moving it to the new level. So that's what one person can do. So this is, you know, language and consciousness is a variable and most people don't get it. That's a huge, huge Thank you. point. Thank you. Uh, next up is Dominique followed by George. Dominique. Well, hello, Dr. Ryan. Once again, many thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. My question goes around this uh, mental affliction that I happened to just learn yesterday, something called aphantasia, which is the, ina the inability to see what you describe as the, men uh, the mind eyes. As far as I can understand, this is like a, a recent research. Um, have, you, uh, have you heard of this phenomenon? And if so, have these in any way have challenged or have further support uh, Jane's uh, theory? Uh, Dominic, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, that's a, a very uh, good question. It, it's very pertinent um, to what I'm talking about. So aphantasia is, as you said, it's the inability of people to use their mind's eye. And I, I think it's a very significant point to bring up because certainly at first blush, it seems a challenge 
a Jamesian view of what mental images are. In other words, that mental images are something cultural, something learned. So the, because the assumption people would make, well, if culture is learned, then everyone should easily be able to, excuse me, if, if mental images are learned, then we should all be able naturally to acquire uh, mental images. But Anfantasia seems to challenge that view. So um, I, at this point, I actually don't know what to say, uh, uh, why there are some people who don't have mental images. I haven't looked into it too deeply. I'm not sure. Uh, it could be that these people that, remember, conscious interiority is a package of about a dozen different features and uh, mental images is one of them. And it could be that these people, how they were socialized for some reason, their psyche just did not see the need to have mental images as a key feature of their individualized version of conscious interiority. It could be that their other conscious features are doing more of the work and that their, their, their psychological, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, landscape just doesn't see, just, uh, images don't, just don't fit into that landscape for some reason. I'm not actually uh, sure why. Um, but it is one of the few things that uh, I've come across that certainly challenges, uh, it certainly complicates a Jamesian uh, perspective. I, to my mind, it's not enough to, um, to seriously threaten a Jamesian perspective, but it, as I said, it certainly does make things interesting and more complicated. So uh, thank you. That, that, that's a very, uh, that's a very, as I said, very pertinent uh, uh, point you put, you uh, brought up. Uh, thank you, George. You had a very interesting question. Go ahead. Well, actually, a new one. Um, to the list ontology and epistemology, could you suggest a third or a fourth or a fifth member of that list? Thank you. Um. So, George, you said a, a list. Uh, um, I'm not sure which list you're referring to. Well, uh, we, 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 we use the term ontology. I, I think you may have used it yourself. We use the term epistemology. You may have used that term yourself. Those two words form a list of two. Third member of that list, something which is similar to ontology and epistemology, but distinct. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to, how to answer that. Okay. That, that's fine. We can, um, we can just let it go. I, I, know, I don't even know what, what, uh, um, George, I mean, that's, it's, it's, I don't know the motivation for this. I don't know what, what, let's take your other question. Does language in, in language, does the function follow the technical form? Does the function of language follow the technical form? What do you think, Brian? Well, um, so when we talk about function, we're talking about what something does. When we talk about form, we're talking about the configuration or what shape it takes. So when we're talking about language, um, you know, we'd have to zero in exactly. When you say the, the function of language, you're talking about uh, how language communicates or you're talking uh, some other aspect of language. Um, you, 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 what, I mean, language does many things, right? It transmits knowledge. It allows for interpersonal communication. Um, language can be stored. So those are many of the functions. And does it follow form? Uh, so I guess I'm wondering what, what in this context, what's what the form of a language might be? Do you mean how language, whether it's expressed orally or liter? Or... Let, let, let me take that because I, you know, the, the the concepts of form and function is what we have been using with Louis Sullivan, uh, and we've also been using these concepts with Marshall McLuhan. So let me uh, answer it from that perspective. Um, see what happens is that 
function is what is it that you're trying to do with language, right? And form is the, the technical form in which you are expressing it. So for example, in oral communication, you're, you're, you're trying to communicate and the form that you're using is, is words that are spoken out. And then in liter, uh, you know, in literacy, we are using a form which is written down. Now, the question is, how does communication change? How, how, what the language is trying to do change? And I think the, the best formulation of this issue is Marshall McLuhan's formulation that we shape our tools and then the tools shape us. So we invent writing, but as a result of inventing writing, it changes the way in which we function. Uh, so there is a this kind of a loop between form and function. It's not just one directional. So if you sort use a form of writing, that is going to change. If you use if you use writing as a form for expressing language, then that is going to change the way in which you are actually using the language. So there is this you know, this loop. So for example, let's say you're speaking, right? Your ability to introspect and be self-aware of what you're saying is limited by the fact that you cannot be aware of what you're saying while you're saying it as well. But the moment you put it down on paper, you're able to look at it as an external object. So your ability to reflect on your language goes up, you know, goes up, you know, by an order of magnitude, because you can do that recursively in trying to perfect that. So I think that's the, that, that's the relationship that, that I see. Um, let's see. Uh, Pahe Pahe, you had a uh, comment or a question. Go ahead. Uh, it was just a comment um, towards regarding like evolution of language and like um i guess what could shed more light on it is like how i guess how in each particular language um they express conditionals and like different cases and like hypotheticals because i i i, I remember um there was this um isolated language somewhere in south America, where they can only express, um, I guess, objects that they're simultaneously viewing, and they only exist, I guess, when they're simultaneously viewing. And once um, they're out of sight, they don't longer exist. But, but I was just trying to add on to. Um, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian. Would you like to comment on it? Yeah, so that's actually a, a very important, fascinating issue you brought up. Um, and again, this this uh, th this idea of hypotheticals and conditionals, of course, each language grammatically is going to express those differently. But I would hypothesize that if you w were able to go back. Um, 3,000 years ago, before people were conscious, you would not have the same amount of hypo, hypothecality, for lack of a, a better word. Uh, people, of course, to a degree, would use conditionals. And you could find some grammatic, grammatical features of a language that use condi conditionals, even among bicameral people. However, I would submit that you would not find as much, and you would not, you would not find as many examples of, uh, if you look at the ancient writings, the text, um, the idea for people who uh, were pre-conscious is that reality is reality. What you see is what you see. And a strong sense of the hypothetical comes later when people started to become uh, conscious because to, to engage in um, a hypothetical mindset demands a certain language. And you have to have not just certain grammatical features, but you have to have um, a language that is interiorized or psychologized to the point 
where a person is comfortable with conditionals, where a person is comfortable with, uh, hy with um, uh, a hypothetical uh, mindset. So there's actually a, a lot that could be uh, said on that. And, but I wanna just say that that's a really good example, the type of thing that we should be looking at because if James is correct in what he had to say, we can test his theories by looking for, for example, um, to what degree did people discuss hypothetical things before they became conscious? And like I said, I would never say that there is no trace of conditional thinking or, or um, hypothetical thinking uh, before people became conscious. I would just say that it would not be a, a predominant part of their culture, unlike today, where we think um, uh, yeah, we, we, we use a hypothetical mindset uh, very often in order to plan our day. Thank you. Next up is Laura. Off the mark. Um, could you have a, a kind of hallucination where you're not seeing the person, but you're hearing them speak? Yeah, yes, most certainly. In fact, probably most hallucinations are not visual. Most hallucinations are auditory. So, okay. yeah, so we want to think of hallucinations as coming through different sensory modes, auditory, visual, uh, olfactory or smelling, even taste and touch. And uh, usually the, the, mo the two most common type of hallucinations are auditory and uh, visual. Uh, so okay. auditory. All right, because I've had those, but I also had when my fr I've I've had hallucinations for quite a while. The first one I had, if I may say, it was a building I was looking at, and it was waving. And at first, I couldn't understand what was going on, but it was like a sine cur curve kind of occurring with this apartment building. And the second one I had was a head, a no body, long hair, and flowing, and it was floating across my room, um, which was kind of scary and grotesque at the same time. And then there was other ones that involved people. And I always felt when I was hallucinating that the images were not like dreamlike, but they became very clear and sharp images. Like, And that I always called a hallucination. Was that, does that make sense? Is that? Sure. The, Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for clearing that up with me. And yes, I hallucinate quite a bit. Um. Well, uh, thank you for sharing those experiences. And um, as I said, I think probably there are more people who have hallucinations than is reported. Um, and of course, I think a big reason for that is because in our culture, we associate hallucinations with something abnormal. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of evidence that most hallucinations are probably not linked to some sort of uh, pathopsychological condition. Um, and, and I think so what happens is people, there's a stigma associated with admitting that I have hallucinations. And so what happens is not enough people talk about it, not enough people report it, because as I said, we assume that there must be something wrong with the person. All right, folks, uh, does anybody else have any more questions about this topic? Okay, uh, so then I'm, I'm going to uh, ask a couple more questions. Uh, so Brian, I want to follow up on the observation that you were making in response to my first uh, question about kind of the complexity of how the language develops across these various, various media. Um, I mean, it looks like writing in terms of if you, if I was to look at the change, writing has caused the maximum, a really cataclysmic change from before. Do, do you, do you agree that the impact of writing is one of the largest impacts? Yes, I do. Um, and I, why, I mean... why do you think that is? Why, why did writing produce this large an impact? Well, I think there are many types of impact that resulted from the development of uh, literacy. Um, so one impact has to do with, and you touched upon this before, how it changes our psychological processes. 
And what happens when we write something down, we start to understand language as having things in it that are detachable. And we start to develop a vocabulary, vocabulary list. We start to develop a grammar. We actually see a certain mechanics working in language. Language begins to take on, whether it's oral or literate, once it's written down, it takes on a life of its own. It becomes a thing. And it's a little bit difficult to articulate, but somehow that changes how we view interpersonal communication between people. Um, uh, and then uh, another very important impact, uh, sort of consequence of literacy has to do with economics, politics, social relations. And so, you know, remember that probably throughout most of human history, once literacy entered the scene, most people were not literate. The literacy was something usually, until recently, usually restricted to a scribal class or the well-educated class. And this allowed uh, economic control of people. It allowed political control of people. Um, it, li literacy gave us sort of uh, almost a, a magical power. And I, I remember years ago, I saw a movie and I can't for the life of me remember the name of the movie, but basically it had to do with your, these European missionaries were among North American Indians and they were uh, captured by the Indians. And so they wanted to show the Indians that they had a magical power. And what one of the missionaries wrote something down and then whispered it to the Indian. And then the Indian took the piece of paper to another missionary and showed it to him. And he read the word to the Indian and the Indian could not understand how that was possible. And the, 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 the Native American, I should say, was just flabbergasted and believed that there must be some magical property to the, to the paper somehow. So, so that, that's just an example, but it's very easy to underestimate how, as a technology, literacy changed everything. It allows us to store information. It allows us to plan long term. It allows us to manipulate in a super abstract way information that in oral cultures you simply cannot do. So literacy really is sort of a, uh, a, a secret weapon, as it were, a super technology. Yeah, no, and, I, I um, really like So Yeah, most definitely. Uh, literacy has really changed everything. No, I really like your answer because it's like a comprehensive answer. It cover, covers not just how the thinking changed, but how social relations changed, how economics changed. And you can't, and, and that's all, I think it's a holistic way of thinking. And I think that's the right, right way of approaching this. Um, next up is going to be Katie. Katie, go ahead. I kind of, uh, I haven't really quite uh, worked it through how to ask it in my mind, but it's something like dreams. People often say dreams are things that are going through your subconscious. And hallucinations, like how would you relate like the, the idea of subconscious to all of these different terms that you're using? The subconscious, well, um, I mean, you mentioned dreams. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll just ment I'll comment on dreams, the way I view dreams. Um, dreams actually are a type of consciousness. When you're dreaming, you are conscious, but it's a very restricted, limited type of conscious. Um, how that relates to uh, the subconscious, uh, um, well, maybe, let me ask you, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by the subconscious or what type of connection you see between the subconscious and hallucinations or dreams? Uh, subconscious might be something you're working through and you're like, you're having, you're struggling with something and then it's kind of buried. That's what I was kind of thinking, something that you've kind of buried or something that you've kind of been working through in the back of your mind, if that okay. makes sense. Well, okay, so don't forget that um, most mentation or most psychological processes occur non-consciously, or you might say subconsciously or unconsciously. Um, and many times we do have a problem 
and the solution pops into our head. And it's not that we weren't thinking about the problem, but the part of our mind that, that was non-conscious was trying to solve the problem. And many times the solutions or a type of revelation actually come through dreams. Um, and many times for some people, especially in the ancient world, through hallucinations where you, where you would hallucinate a God. And, and even in the modern world, there are reports of people uh, hearing a voice telling them to do something or not do something or explaining something to them. And um, that's, I guess you could call sort of modern day um, uh, re revelation. But the point is, it seems mysterious because it seems like it came out of nowhere. But whether you're hallucinating or experiencing everyday conscious interiority, the point is most of our thinking is not conscious. Most of our thinking is subconscious. Um, so I'm, I, hopefully that um, sheds some light uh, on your question. Yeah. Next question is from Laura. Laura, what's your question? Uh, Laura, you need to unmute yourself. Do that. I'm thinking about the subconscious part of this because um, one of my hallucinations involved uh, my parents, um, particularly my mother, who died in 1974 and I was um, talking to her and my father. They wanted me, it was always the event that we had to go to involved somebody who died and they were always telling me I had to be ready at a certain time to go out. And I always told them to wake me up to make sure and I'd get up late and they had left and that was it. And I thought that, the, and I had it multiple times and I thought it was the weirdest thing, you know, to bring up from my subconscious that they would be there to tell me to get ready to go somewhere and then leave without me. Mm. And it drove me crazy. Sure, <laughs> and it, it stopped. Mm -hmm. But where the hell does something like that come from? <laughs> 40, my mother's dead 46 years. I mean, and, <laughs> and, and to get, and not see them, but think that they're in my home. I hear them. I hear noise in my house. They're all bustling around. I wake up and, you know, and then I, I call to them. I call mommy, mommy, no answer, no answer. And uh, that's when I finally get up to see that they're gone. But I don't know. Okay. Well, you know, I, I, I think what you're talking about is um, it's not that unusual, actually. Many people have similar experiences. And I, I think it shows us, I think, you know, you said something like, where does it come from? And I think what we have to keep in mind is what I was talking about before, this idea that we think we know what's going on in our mind, but remember that consciousness is just a small flashlight and it can only shine light on what it sees. And in other words, there's a whole huge dark room of unconscious or subconscious processes going on that we're not aware of. And our mind, uh, in a way that we're not aware of, is constantly doing things. There's a tremendous, there's this huge machinery in the back room that many of us are not aware of because we make the mistake that many people think that Con that whatever I'm thinking, I'm conscious and consciousness is whatever I'm thinking. And that's not true. We're doing a lot of thinking that we're not conscious of all the time. Um, and every now and then it bubbles up. So we really don't understand very well the relationship between consciousness and this subconscious machinery. And remember that consciousness is just the tip of the iceberg. And underneath the water is floating this huge amount of this sea of information. And I think to be a human, to, to be a, a well-developed, healthy person, um, part of that goal should be trying to get in touch with what is going on under the surface. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, you know, that's why one of the reasons why I think we invented uh, re religion is to deal with what is going on underneath the, the surface. Um, but I think a sensitive person is someone who pays attention, tries to figure out 
what is underneath that surface, what is bubbling up and how to confront that. Thank you, Brian. Uh, folks, so what we are going to do uh, in future uh, meetups is that Brian is writing uh, or has written a book about how to apply Jane's ideas to mental health and personal growth. So we're going to now go into a series uh, on that. So looking forward to having you join there. And Brian, looking forward to the meetups. Okay. All right, folks. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for your much. questions. All very interesting. Thank you, everybody. Bye.